Brady Papinga joins the program here on BYU Sports Nation. Brady, great to have you back on the show, man. How you doing? It's good to be here, guys. How you guys doing? We are good. It's July, Brady, so we're throwing out the uh, the hypothetical, and I want to get your opinion on this. What record would you tolerate if BYU, uh, one of those wins was against Utah? <laughs> what record would I tolerate? Meaning, oh, my God. Like, if the so season doesn't go well, but one of the wins is Utah. Oh, my gosh. I don't even <laughs> process this i've never you know when i've competed i've never once had uh i hope i didn't lose you there got to those but i never once had, like thought that about utah like my whole season is gonna be either a success or a failure if we beat utah yep you know i grew up in the era where you know listen to this guys i grew up in the the era when utah when the, their scout came to to recruit me in evanston wyoming he walks in with his Utah shirt on. He comes and calls me out on the line in uh, in lunch. You know, and my head coach is so proud because we don't. There's not many Division One athletes that come through Evanston, Wyoming. And I immediately go to the guy and I go, "You're wasting your time. I'm I'm going to BYU." And he looked at me so dejected, like I came all this way. I'm like, "Dude, Utah's. I don't. That's not even on my radar." So that's the mentality <laughs> I come come to the. You know, with Utah, I, I don't. I get the, I mean, the rivalry is great and all that kind of stuff. The banter is unbelievable because, you know, everybody has bragging rights and I get it. We, we, you know, we haven't beat Utah for so many years, but I just don't put so much stock in beating them to where I would say, like, whether you beat them or not dictates the success or failure of the season. Yeah, we were talking about Brian felt strongly about, hey, I'd be willing to go 1-11. and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I value, it just depends what you value. If you value that game more than anything else or the season great i i value this season uh over you like if you said you lose to utah for the rest of eternity but byu goes 11 and 1 every year i'm like sign me up man that would be incredible so yeah what well i'll say this let me let me say this i get where you guys are coming from though because you're immersed with a bunch of utah fans and we all know utah and byu fans are the same i'm not gonna just say byu fans are completely uh you know free and clear of this kind of you know, behavior, but Utah fans are, they can be very classless. And I mean, at the most inopportune times, I mean, you could be shopping, minding your own business and somebody recognizes you as like a former BYU player or currently associated with the program. And they'll come up to you in the mall or something and just start talking smack out of nowhere. And you're like, are you kidding me? Like, so I get where you guys are coming from where you'd like to like have those tables flipped. I get that, you know, being out here in California, I don't deal with that very much. But uh, I, it, it's kind of two different worlds, you know, because being there, you kind of want to shut up the Utah fans a little bit because they've been bugging you for the last decade. I was in Tillamook, Oregon last week. Uh, I'm at the, you know, cheese and ice cream factory. It's awesome. I'm wearing a BYU hat, <laughs> and a kid comes up to me. He's probably, I don't know, like 20 or something. He goes, oh, BYU fan. I go, yeah. And he goes, go Utes. <laughs> and I thought I don't remember asking you whether you were a Utah fan or not, which is which is see. Funny. And that, that's the same thing with me, wow. man. And I actually started to flip the script a little bit. Like I was at the gym, I don't know, maybe two months ago, and I saw somebody with a, a Utah shirt on, and I walked up to him and I said, and I pointed in his face and I said, I hope. I'm like, where's my camera? At? I said, I hope you guys lose every single game this you year. Did? Oh come and, on, and man! He, and he was like, No, not every game. And I said, Every single game. He's like, You don't mean that. And I said for your entire athletic department. Every sport. Brian. Every sport. You're the new Max I, Hall. Look, check this out, man. I, like, it's to that point, man. Like, like, when I played, because, like, BYU was actually winning and competitive, I was just like, I'm just, I just want to beat you guys. I don't really care. Everything else is irrelevant. But now it's like, I hope you lose every game by, like, 50 points. That's, That's how deep it is. That's extreme, man. <laughs> That's how deep it is. I'm serious. <laughs> it is. We're talking to Brady Papinga on BYU Sports Nation. Okay, so that's that's Utah. Let's talk about this team this season. Obviously, an amazing season last year. Schedule gets blown up, but BYU was ready and performed way above, I think, what we thought they would do. 11-1, and one, Zach Wilson's second pick, all these guys in the NFL. It was awesome. This schedule's not going to be that. Um, there's seven Power Fives on it. There's Boise State. But, Brady, it feels like among these Power Fives, there's some winnable games there where BYU's matched up e and being equal to or better than Arizona and Virginia and dot, 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 although those will be competitive, maybe not Arizona, 
What do you think of this year's team against this year's schedule? Well, I mean, there's a lot of question marks. I'll tell you the biggest challenge, and this is the biggest challenge, at least it's been in my career, is how you deal with success. You know, and I think last year having such a phenomenal season and you have the caveat of the Coastal Carolina game where it literally came together like two days before the game actually was played. Then you travel across the country with minimal preparation. I mean, it's pretty much like they went undefeated last year. Like that's, you know, kind of the vibe. But then at the same time, the level of competition is – like you said, it's nothing like this year. So I don't know where their minds are at in terms of are they thinking they're better than they really are based off of their season last year because their schedule was so soft. I get that they, you know, navigated it and they figured out a way to play it. Or do they have a chip? Because the way they're going to have success in this schedule is they have to have a chip on their shoulder. They have to play like nobody respects them. And like every single play, they're out there sending a message there to their opponent that not only are we just as good as a power five conference or, or a power five team, which BYU is a power five team. I don't care what anybody else says that we've been power five forever uh, since that stadium was built 65,000 and BYU was a perennial top 10 team, tw- top 25 team going to bowl games. Now the BYU I grew up being a big fan of. So it's never been a discussion to me whether it's Power 5 or not. It's just other teams don't want to accept that. BYU is hated throughout the country by so many people. They, don't, they just don't like BYU. They find us to be very holier-than-thou, self-righteous. So the problems in the, when you look at BYU, when they've had issues in the past, and I, I experienced it, is when they think they're better than they are, and they think just because they're BYU, they can show up and win. When they've had success has been the other side of it to where they've showed up with a chip on their shoulder wanting to prove something to somebody on a week-in, week-out basis because they don't feel like they're being respected. They don't feel like they're given, you know, enough, uh, you know, credit for the successes they've had because everybody says, oh, you played a soft schedule, all that kind of stuff, and they come out and punch you in the face. So that, to me, is really what's going to dictate the success of the season is where is the overall collective mentality of this team? You know, are they, they riding high from last year thinking, oh, man, we're one of the nation's best teams. Look at that. We had a number two overall pick last year. Blah, blah. <laughs> and that can happen very easily thinking, oh, we're so good. We're just going to show up and beat teams. And so that mindset's going to get you beat real quick. The other flip side of it is you're going to come in week in, week out with an edge and a sense of urgency to play ball and prove yourself. And if they do that, they're going to have a successful year. They're going to be right in. So, Brady, I, I think for certain guys and individuals like like me, I mean, it was very easy to go week in, week out. Shoot, I would say every day, you know, with a chip on my shoulder. Also understanding that, you know, I had some challenges being 5'6", when the average corner, uh, starting corner for, you know, a Division One program is uh, six foot one. Um, so with, with, with what you're saying as, as far as them having that mentality, do you think that falls on the coaching staff or do you think that that has to be, uh, you know, that has to come from within each individual player? Man, Brad, I love the way you play too. Cause you, cause what you're saying is going to be the answer to your question, because when you were there, you established an ownership of the mentality as a player. And people felt that. People felt that you played with an edge. People felt like you were out to have something to prove. Your teammates felt that. They came and they joined you. They jumped on you. Your bandwagon, essentially. That's how every team is built. Because a coach, coaches can get up there and they'll tell every team, like, this is the secret to success. The real question whether or not that actually is implemented comes down to, does the team buy into that? And do they practice and express that in the way they play? And is it done consistently? Because it can happen in one game, and then all of a sudden you kind of lose that edge and the following week you get beat or whatever. But does it happen over the course of the season? Does it progress? So it has to be internally built. It has to be an ownership issue within the team. And that's why this year, because last year I think Zach Wilson, you know, what was so phenomenal about that team was it was, I wouldn't say it's his team, but what he did in terms of, oh, wow, I'm in a competition now. I am going to prepare myself to compete at the highest level. I'm going to work with John Beck. I'm gonna, if I have to drive 12 hours each way over a weekend to do it, I'm going to do that. And then he comes back, and that's now starting to pay off. Other guys felt that. Um, that right there was the key to their success last year. That's gone. You know, you have other guys that are, you know, saying, oh, I'm working with John Beck. But who cares? It doesn't matter who you work with. It really matters that mentality of that edge that you carry yourself with. And is that now something that's shared with your teammates? 
So that's just the unknown that you never know. You know, Kelly, my younger brother, you know, he used to coach BYU now in Virginia, he used to talk about that. You know, you, you go through training camp and you either be really optimistic or you wouldn't be, you know, that optimistic. You'd go into the first game and it'd be like, wow, like I had no idea like what was going to happen. You know, and I think that's where we're at right now. Until that first game hits and that whistle blows, like we don't really know <laughs> what's going to happen with this team. But a lot of the the, to the topics and dynamics we're talking about that will be on display and we'll be able to see if they're being practiced or not. But one is it's absolutely internal. It's an internal leadership issue. I appreciate your kind words, man. You, I was literally blushing and flexing at the same time. So I, 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 I appreciate it. I was, I was turning a little purple. Appreciate your kind words. I saw you. You're one of my guys, man. I, I, there's, there's guys throughout BYU that I'd love to be teammates with. You were one of them. There's a bunch of other guys, too. There's guys on this year's roster, same same thing. Like, you know, uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about it, but, like, Peyton Wilger, he's my kind of guy. Like, if I built a linebacker room, he would be a guy that I'd like to have in there. So, uh, you know, there's some kindred spirits floating around at BYU. For sure, Brian, you were one of them, man. Definitely. That's awesome. I love that. Let's talk about Peyton, uh, who's uh, part of an NIL deal with, with you, with uh, XPT and his training. Uh, he, he posted the other day using some of your equipment. So uh, what, what's the deal you have with Peyton, and how will that benefit him? Yeah, well, we've had a – so basically, I don't, just the long story short is from my experience playing football and training, I took that and came up with and developed a rack that embodies all my favorite elements – of training, you know, and, and the two of my most favorite elements are first safety. And the second one is working in a way that most translates to the field of competition. And that means explosive. So if you look at, and I mean, I hate to go pure science geek on everybody here, but just real quick, bear with me. I'm not going to be too worried. <laughs> Bottom line is 90% of the movements that are done in the weight room. And this goes for all programs throughout the country are done in a way that you're decelerating the bar for the majority of the range of motion. So if you equate that to translation to how it translates to the field, you're actually counter training to how you'll play. And that's, like I said, that's just a common practice. And so not until you let that bar go and that bar has something that catches it for you, are you fully training like you're going to play, okay? That's the rack that I developed. It was ended up, it named, we named it the XPT called the Extreme Power Trainer. Uh, the track team actually purchased a unit a couple years ago and they use it for their throwers. And so when this NIL deal came to be, you know, I, I always had Peyton in the back of my mind. I'd been talking to him just because, you know, maybe it's because he's wearing the 49. I don't know. But I like <laughs> the way he plays. Like, a, You know, if uh, and there's guys like that throughout BYU that I look at and I'll be like, that's my kind of guy. Tough, gritty, goes and gets his job done, plays a swagger, goes out there, plays on a week-in, week-out basis with, that, you know, urgency. And so I thought, you know, this would be a great opportunity to partner together to where – he can help promote it, but then also, you know, I can help him out because, like I said, this is able to train in an area, and you're, you're going to see it with him now that uh, has been untrained for many football players. And, uh, you know, he's already starting to feel immediately because it is new, uh, you know, some benefits of it. And so it's, it's you know, a, uh, it's a partnership. And, and I'm, I'm looking for other guys too, you know, that fit the same mold as Peyton to where, they're, they're hard workers and they're going to train. They're going to take it serious, you know, and they're going to obviously represent the brand as we, uh, as we like it to be represented. He's a great football player. He's going to be an NFL draft pick. It's just a matter of where, and he's a good dude off the field as well. So you picked a fantastic yeah. guy to start with Brady. We great. always appreciate the time, man. We love your opinion. We love your insight. Thanks for uh, spending a couple minutes with us. My pleasure guys. Have a great day. You too. Brady Papinga here on BYU sports nation.